this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That is our sports betting podcast here on the FanDuel Podcast Network, getting you set for week three of college football and breaking down our favorite bets on the board. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Ed Fang of thepowerrank.com. You can find him on Twitter at thepowerrank. Ed, I'm finally paying up. I lost our bets with the Northwestern <laughs> Stanford game. So I am wearing a Stanford t-shirt and people who listen to the audio only version. Uh, it's It's very red. It's very tree uh, and It's uh, supposed to be cardinal in color, but... Yeah, cardinal. Because it's the Stanford cardinal. Is but, this like uh, a maze yeah. thing where, like, if, if you were to say Stanford red, people would, like, attack you in the streets? Well, Stanford fans aren't that aggressive. They're too busy studying and <laughs> right. starting companies and stuff. But, but yeah, Stanford red, I mean, it would be more of an embarrassment to you, right? You know? Right, exactly. Like It's like spilling a drink on a girl on your first date. It's just... Right. And I can't go walk around Ohio State saying red, you know, crimson and scarlet or whatever it is. So uh, <laughs> the Stanford Cardinal shirt firmly on me. I am draped in my shame. Looks good, man. Looks good. Yeah, I figured you would approve of this. Uh, I just yes. arrived yesterday because I am too cheap to pay for Amazon Prime. So it took a while for it to get here. But uh, finally, I can pay you back. But Ed, tough stuff over at Stanford uh, with their tackle done for the year, you know, first round draft yeah. type. They do get Costello back, but like, it's just that's just really rough circumstances to start a year. Well, yeah, but I mean, the real problem is on the defensive side of the ball, where a true freshman, Caden Slovis, is throwing for over what I think it was 11 yards per pass attempt. Yeah. So that's where my real concern is. I don't mind that they lost to USC, and USC is actually getting a little bit of love in the markets, yeah. uh, which I think is kind of interesting because I still don't really believe in Clay Helton. But, yeah, so the defensive side of the ball is where, where, I, where I worry about Stanford a little bit. Do you think that game was more about USC or about Stanford, the way things played out there? Because, like you said, USC actually is kind of, uh, I mean, they're, they're getting a lot of love this week. In they a are. not super easy environment as they go to BYU, they're right. four-point favorites right now. Do you think that right. game was more about USC or was it more about Stanford? It's tough to know. I saw bits and pieces of the first half. Um, I, I I really don't know. I mean, yeah. I can imagine Stanford's defense being bad. I can imagine USC's offense being really good. So I think without more data, I don't want to say anything definitive about right. that. For sure. And that is not one of the games we're going through for today. We had a guest lined up, but uh, unfortunately got pulled into a meeting at the last second. So we're just going to lean on Ed's numbers here and see what they say for week number three. We'll also have our NFL preview for week two going up tomorrow. We'll break down three big games in the slate. And uh, we'll also talk Pat's Dolphins because the line in that game abundantly interesting uh so we want to break down that one if you want to get that podcast and every podcast as it goes up make sure you subscribe to covering the spread here on the uh, FanDuel podcast network just search for covering the spread on apple podcasts spotify the google play store tune in iHeartRadio, wherever you can find it. And uh, while you're there, if you like what Ed has to say later today uh, or what our guest says tomorrow, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Uh, we do appreciate that as always. Ed, anything else on your mind here is before we dive into covering the past and look back at our college football episode from last week? Marcus Mariota. Oh, man. So Jim, Jim came on my show and talked about Marcus Mariota. Thought he had to have a pretty good season. Three touchdowns, zero picks, 7.7 .7 yards per attempt. Uh, and and a big road win at Cleveland. But the problem is, I'm also a Baker Mayfield guy. So well, yeah, you can't have everything, man. You got <laughs> right. you got to pick one. And you know what? You didn't talk about Baker Mayfield on my podcast. That's true. Uh, Marcus about Marcus Mariota on the Football yeah. Analytics Show. Marcus got a little lucky because Derrick Henry housed a 75 yard touchdown, but he had a really good pass to AJ Brown, and I think people were kind of overlooking AJ Brown entering the year, like as an addition to the offense and. Again, they didn't have their starting left tackle in that game. And the Browns' defense is legit good. So I didn't come away from that game thinking that, like, Mariota crushed it. But I thought that he was going to do really badly in that game. Really? So he exceeded my ex – well, like, I like the Browns' defense a lot. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, Titans, I still have more questions about the Browns' defense. I right. mean – well, the I, defensive I think... front specifically is good. And right. the Titans didn't have their left tackle or their right guard. And okay. so, like, in Daily Fantasy – I had a lot of Browns defense shares, which did not go that well, obviously. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. But I was my expectations were low for Marcus because of the context around it, given that they were on the road against a good defense. This weekend, right. I think, will be the best test we'll get, though, because they're at home facing Indy. And you talked about, even before the Andrew Luck retirement, your concerns around Indy because of their defense. And yep. I want to see what Mariota can do in that game. If he right. can duplicate the numbers that he had uh, against Cleveland, maybe get a little bit less lucky than he did there. I'll feel pretty good. So cautiously optimistic. Is that is that an okay way I can phrase that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I mean, so, yeah. you know, to be very optimistic about any team after one week or two weeks in college football right. is probably an uh, overreaction. It can lead you down some really dumb paths, as I have right. learned plenty of times in the past. But uh, I think that it was better than I expected for the Titans at least, in week number one. Now, with that said, let's dive into last week and take a look back at our college football podcast and interesting things to discuss from our time with Drew Martin then. Covering the past. So last week on the week two college football preview, we had Drew Martin on the show, and you can find him on Twitter at Drew Martin Betts. And I thought that Drew had some really sharp insights here, uh, especially with the two bigger games we discussed. He wanted Texas A&M plus 17 and a half, actually got that number when it was plus 18 and a half, and they did cover right. that. It was late, but it still counts. Uh, late, so he got yep. that one. Yeah, it's it still counts. You know, it backdoor cover is still a cover. Um, he said that for LSU versus Texas – that he didn't want to bet it unless the line got to seven points. And right. what happened? LSU won by exactly seven. The right. number, at least based on when I was watching it, never got to seven. Mm -hmm. And Ed, you talked a lot about Texas before the season. Right. You talked about liking LSU. And Joe Burrow's making you look pretty smart for being into LSU at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I talk much about LSU. I don't love LSU. I, I still yeah. think the program uh, from Coach O... Well, Dave Aranda, the D.C., doesn't have anything to prove in my mind. And that actually right. ended up being the poorer unit on the field right. uh, in that game, which is a little bit of a surprise. You know, maybe Texas's offense is good, and I can definitely believe that. Um, but, you know, Joe Burrow was very good. I, I was not expecting that many points in that game. Uh, I was expecting about that result, you know, touchdown for LSU on the yeah. road, getting it done. They are the better team. Um, but, yeah, a lot of points. I don't, I don't know if we, we talked about the over on that, but. Yeah. Not something I would have expected. Especially well, I thought that it was also interesting because, like, we had talked on this podcast about how people liked Texas more than they should have. Right. And yes. we saw that kind of in the line movement, too, where it opened, I think it was LSU minus three and a half, and it closed right. at, like, minus six and a half. And that's pretty considerable movement. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that was a very interesting game from a betting perspective. No, absolutely. And my number was exactly at LSU six and a half, so I was pretty happy that it closed there. Um, and yeah, you know, not something that I liked, uh, not a game that I like to bet on just again with my hesitations about coach O and, and Joe right. Burrow. Um, uh, but, but they got it done. Yeah. And, uh, Joe Burrow, his Heisman odds are, are five to one now. So that's, wow. that's what a couple of good games will get for you. Uh, we talked about FIU versus Western Kentucky, Western Kentucky won that game outright. Same right. thing for BYU versus Tennessee, uh, BYU won that game in overtime, Tennessee, Yikes. Uh, I had Miami <laughs> minus four and a half against UNC. UNC won that one outright. And I think, Ed, looking back, I may have been underrating UNC just because I didn't expect them to do this with Mac Brown, a very young quarterback. And I thought my expectations overall for UNC entering the year, I was expecting this to maybe be kind of just a year in transition, but they've had two really impressive wins is that enough for you to be kind of high on UNC right now? Uh, no, not really. Uh, my numbers yeah. actually kind of like them, but I, I, I think the jury's still out. I mean, you look at some of the numbers in this game, uh, Miami had better yards per play, had almost 100 yards more. Uh, so, you know, if they play that game again with the same underlying statistics, it could have turned out a little bit differently. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's two weeks, right? So yeah. let's, let's wait a little while and, and see what happens, especially on a, on a team like North Carolina. Well, that makes me feel better about betting Miami. So at least we have that. Thank you, Ed, for that. I appreciate it for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Jim, I run, um, you know, like on my side, like I run a little model which predicts, you know, how many points a team should have scored based on yeah. yards per play and total yards in a game. Yeah. Yards per play is, is the big variable there. Uh, just because it so closely correlates with points scored. Yeah. 
even with the noise of like you know defensive and, and special teams and stuff like that that can affect how many points you score and then total yards to uh to get a sense for pace yeah um so in that little model you know it actually if you put those underlying statistics into the model miami actually wins by seven. Oh wow so, so I feel a lot know, better there's a lot of that. deceiving things in games. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things that can happen to on the scoreboard. And, uh, you know, that's why I just like to look at the underlying efficiency metrics. And so that would lead you to say, don't overreact in a positive sense on UNC's side, but don't also overreact in a negative sense on Miami's side right. just because I lost that game on the road. Yeah, for sure. For okay. sure. I mean, I didn't get a chance to see that game, but, you know, I mean, it looks like Jaron Williams was, was pretty good in, in, yeah. in completing passes and... And uh, I think that projects better for Miami going forward. Uh, I'm not sure yet what to think about North Carolina. And that matches what we saw from him against Florida, too. So I think exactly. that uh, exactly. seeing that lineup is always encouraging. So that was week two. We're going to dive into week three in just one second. But if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you up to a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive in now to week number three of college football and break down some of the funnest games. Is fun a word? Regardless, the funnest games on the board in week three. Covering the present. All right, let's take a look at week three in college football. And Ed, before we really dive into these numbers, I want to pick your brain a bit because you've got these models over at thepowerrank.com and things are obviously changing throughout the season. Your models are evolving. We've got two weeks of data on most teams by now. Some teams have played just one game, uh, but like we've got some data. Sure. This early in the season, how much of your model is data from 2019 versus the conceptions your model had of the teams entering the year. Yeah, I mean, look, the vast majority is still the preseason model. I really like, uh, especially what I've done over the past two years with my preseason uh, analytics, especially in college football, which is a combination of data and then what the markets think in terms of win totals. Uh, but, you know, like about 10%-ish uh, is 10, 15 percent right now is what we've seen this year. And the way I do it is is pretty simple. I kind of look at how a team performed on the score, scoreboard compared to what the markets closed at for that point spread. And then I also look at yards per play, um, how teams perform compared to what the markets expected. So if you're a team like Wisconsin and you've just obliterated your two com- opponents, you're going to move up pretty high. Uh, unfortunately, a team like Michigan uh, has struggled in both departments. A uh, really tough game against Army. Uh, so they're a little bit lower. Um, definitely a game we'll be talking about next week. But it just gives you an example. Uh, you know, and even, you know, this is the the hard part about handicapping, especially in college football, because teams can move really fast yeah. in their number. And you don't have to look further than what happened to Louisville last year. You know, the models kind of always had Louisville. They could never catch up to just how bad a job Bobby Petrino was doing with that team. So it's always looking at the model and, you know, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to kind of get the mean behavior in some sense, but you know, some teams you should kind of lean more on the preseason and some teams you should lean more on what's going on this season, like, like a Louisville last year. Uh, And and I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go through some of these games. Well, I think the important thing with Louisville last year too, is that how bad they were last year will also influence the way they're viewed in the model this year. And it's kind of like, it's kind of hard to adjust for that because they pretty clearly sure. quit on Bobby Petrino last year. Yep. But like, you're not going to be able to like fully account for that. So do you try to just, is there a way that you can manually adjust uh, the inputs from 2019 versus 2018 for various teams? Like, I guess, how do you yeah. handle Louisville in 2019 is kind of what I'm getting to here. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, later in the season, so after I get about three, four weeks of data, like I can start doing metrics just based on this year. Interesting. And so what I give do for my members is I tell you, you know, what is the projection on this game preseason? What do the markets think this season, which is kind of a completely different predictor, right? Because it's right. more wisdom of crowds based. And then what do the pure numbers say? So in terms of margin of victory, uh, yards per play, probably success rate this year. What does that say just based on data from this year? So the number like the number that, that I'll be talking about on the show, this is this is a combination of those three things mm-hmm. uh, or, or, or will be later in the season. Um, but 
you get those separate components to kind of make your own judgments about which one you feel is most important. And that's obviously going to be different for different teams. Right. And you kind of alluded to this before, but when you're trying to dig into 2019 numbers, is it mostly yards per play? Uh, like if, if you were giving advice to someone trying to dig into 2019 data, what right. would you say for them to focus on from a, from a numbers perspective? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough one too, because I would have told you over a lot over the last couple of years, like, yeah, yards per play is great. Yeah. The more I look into it, the more I realize, you know, there's a lot of randomness that goes into yards per play. Yeah. You think about like a big play that goes for a touchdown, you know, running back just happens to break a tackle and, and goes 80 instead of 10 yards. Uh, that can have a huge effect on your yards per play numbers. So that's why I've been starting to look at success rate numbers. Uh, in all my football predictions, I incorporated it into my NFL model last year. I think it really helps. Uh, we'll be doing that for college football this year. And and some of the work Bill Conley has done has shown that success rate is more sticky from early to late season. So if you right. have a high success rate early in the season, uh, it you tend to have a higher success rate later in the season. So that, it, you know, when you're looking at small samples, it's better to lean on that uh, than a yards per play. Okay, that's metric. nice. I it's kind of nice not to have a guest, actually, just to get to pick your brain, which is I, which is something that I very much enjoy. So let's continue doing that here and break down three of the bigger games on the board for this week. We will talk about uh, Iowa versus Iowa State. Not sure if I'm allowed to say the nickname of that game. El Asico, I guess like, I'll just say it. Uh, El Asico. We're going to talk about that in covering the future. So we're going to save that game for later uh, with college game day out there. Uh, so we'll talk about that one later on. But let's start things off here with Oklahoma at UCLA. As of right now at the FanDuel Sportsbook, Oklahoma a 23-point favorite. The total in that game opened, I believe it was at 66, but it's now 73 and a half. Ed, UCLA is a team that last week you said – you really kind of wanted no part of. And yeah. it, I feel like they validated that last week. So what do you see in this game to <laughs> Oklahoma and, and UCLA? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a perfect example where I want to kind of throw out my preseason number on UCLA. Um, yeah. You know, when I run this model, it has Oklahoma by 13. That kind of makes no sense to me. Um, right. I, I mean, I just feel like UCLA might be a program that's struggling. Uh it doesn't look like they, despite having almost all their starters back on the de defensive side of the ball, doesn't look like they've really done that much on that side of the ball. And that's a real problem when you're playing Oklahoma, uh, a team that looks like it hasn't lost a step, even though they lost the first pick in the NFL draft and, and four drafted offensive linemen. And, um, you know, on offense, you know, Chip Kelly's supposed to be the offensive guy, but Dorian Thompson Robbins, the quarterback, you know, couldn't hit a throw against Cincinnati. Uh, really upped the completion rate against uh, San Diego State, but wasn't very efficient in terms of yards per play. So it's uh, he he threw for 4.8 yards per play, which is uh, yards per pass attempt, which is not going to cut it. Uh, just for the record, so that number uh, includes sacks. I include sacks. Yeah. I count sacks as pass plays. Uh, this is not the case in official college football numbers. So that's something you want to be wary of. Like if if my yards per rush. Uh, is different from what you're seeing it's because i've taken sacks out of the i don't define that as a rush right. as they do in typical college football statistics uh so just want to make that clear and the same thing that number fires numbers do for the nfl yep. is they include stats and in all pat or sacks and all passing efficiency numbers because like a sack is not a turnover but it's like next up on like the damage scale uh, along with there with like penalties, like sacks put you well behind. Right. Uh, and that's a, a pretty damaging thing right now. Again, the line is minus 23 for Oklahoma. It opened at minus 21 and a half. So there has been a lot of movement there. One and a half points, 94% uh, of the bets and 97% of the money are on Oklahoma at the FanDuel Holy Sportsbook. Uh, so like, I wouldn't be surprised if this number moved more is it a situation where you would be willing to bet Oklahoma at that number, given that it may move even more? Or are you just saying you want no part of UCLA? Yeah, I think I want no part of any game involving UCLA. It's kind of like staying away from Louisville last year. You just right. you just kind of have no idea what's going on. You know, maybe you can find a beat writer that's got some insight into the team. Um, but, you know, I mean, Chip Kelly came in with all this fanfare last year, and, and I want him to succeed because he's got right. all these ideas about analytics and, and health and, and using numbers, and I want him to succeed. I, I just don't see it so far. 
Yeah. Uh, and the problem is they're also facing Jalen Hurts, who has looked amazing. And yep. part of that has been, you know, yards after the catch, his receivers creating for him. But 17.3 adjusted yards per attempt for Jalen Hurts through his first 41 yeah. attempts. Uh, that number does not include the, the sacks, but it's kind of bonkers what he's yeah. doing right now. Yeah, and I haven't looked at it, but when is he going to face a real defense? I mean, uh, All right, yeah. let me pull up the schedule here because – I am yeah, also we interested. Get to in, Iowa State. I definitely, I definitely. Iowa State's a very good defense, uh, uh, so that would be um, Texas, one maybe, of them for sure. Maybe is a defense. Uh, so I don't. You know, I mean, Jalen Hurts might win the Heisman because of uh, of strength of schedule here in, in some yeah. sense, right? I mean, TCU is probably going to put up a pretty good defense. So you've got Texas Tech, Kansas. No, no, uh, Texas. Uh, the Red River shootout is October 12th. Okay. And then West Virginia, meh, Kansas State. Iowa State is not until November 9th. Wow. TCU is November 23rd. Okay. And by that point, sentiment on Jalen Hurts as it relates to Heisman voting will not be set, but we'll have a pretty good idea. And like, if people are like, okay, cool, this guy's a Heisman, it's going to be hard to dissuade them from that. So right. like... I think I would say this, like Jalen Hurts, Heisman odds have come down. I think he was seven to one when I was looking earlier today. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you like him, like if you want to bet him, you're probably not going to get a better number than that at any point. Uh, he is yep. yeah, seven to one right now. Kind of the same thing we we're talking about uh, with Whale Capper, you know, look at the schedule and decide. And he's by the time he faces Iowa State, he'll probably be like three to one. Or something right. crazy. So I would say that if you want to bet Jalen Hurts, I'm not saying you should want to, but like if you do want to, do it now, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. Uh any thoughts on the total on that game? It's a 73 and a half, and it's gone up quite a bit from where <laughs> things opened. I know number fires numbers like the under here, uh, but what do you think? That's a pretty lofty number there. It is a pretty lofty number given UCLA hasn't shown much competence on the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, you have to balance that with uh, the struggles that Oklahoma has had on on the defensive side of the ball. So yeah, it 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 seems high just because of that. But you know, maybe Oklahoma gets there by themselves. Right. And yeah, probably not. But you know, I mean, right. if it's like seventy to seven. Yeah, it was. Uh, they 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 had eighty points uh, against Houston. That one was forty nine to thirty one, and then right. against South Dakota, it was seventy to fourteen. But I think that. One thing we could see with Oklahoma is maybe they go a little bit more run heavy, uh, given Jalen Hurts being there and stuff like that. I think that could show up more when they're facing not South Dakota opponents. Right. Uh, so I would look at that line. I don't have a good enough feel on it to bet it, but I think if I were to go one way, I'd probably go the under, but I don't feel good enough on that to actually take yeah. that number. Uh, let's move on here to Ohio State against Indiana. Ohio State's 16 and a half point favorite here. The total is 61. Interesting game because Ohio State kind of getting its first, I don't want to say legitimate test because like they haven't faced necessarily bad teams, but Justin Fields has looked amazing the first two games. So, Ed, do you think what we've seen from Justin Fields is legit and here to stay going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I talked to Bud Elliott, you know, a couple years ago before he had ever reached the field the college football field and yeah. you know he he just loved the quarterback class of fields and trevor lawrence and jt daniels mm -hmm. and you know every, everything we've seen so far has uh you know supported that and i think as as many question marks as i had about ohio state coming into the season it's still ohio state and they right. get the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise and um you know i mean so far they look pretty good and i, I don't see why that that doesn't continue uh, against one of the, the lesser teams in, in their division. And we're seeing a lot of, again, money on Ohio State here at FanDuel Sportsbook right now. 99% of the bets and 99% wow. of the money are on Ohio State. So the spread has moved from Ohio State minus 15 to Ohio State minus 16. The total in that game, pretty stagnant. It opened at 60 and a half and is at 61 right now. But that's like, it is a road game. It's a conference game. Do yep. you view Ohio State as being strong enough to cover a number that is not huge, but getting bigger? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think they are, right? I mean, with, with fields and, and the explosiveness of, of the receivers that they 
they do have. I mean, oftentimes it does come down to explosive plays and, and big plays, and, and we know randomness plays a big role in that. So, you know, that's often what happens when you're trying to cover a big number, or, or not necessarily trying to cover, but right. playing in these games. And, uh, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's you know, I think it's pretty fair. My number's a little bit lower than that, but it's not something that jumps off the board at me. It's like, oh, the number's like Indiana, let's go bet that. Uh, it right. seems like it, sh- it it should be a little bit higher. Yeah, Ohio State, the first two games, 42 to nothing against Cincinnati, and then 45 to 21 against FAU. And I think the big key there is kind of the nothing against Cincinnati because last year when Ohio State was vulnerable, it was because of their mm-hmm. defense. And Dwayne, I mean, yep. Dwayne Haskins had stupid numbers all year long, but their defense struggled. It seems like they have changed their approach defensively, playing a lot less man coverage, which is seemingly beneficial for them. Uh, so like, right. I don't dislike Indiana, but I think Ohio State's defense is intriguing. What do your numbers right. say about Ohio State's defense? Uh, are they buying into the, the early season performance, or does it seem a little bit fluky? Um, I mean, nothing yet. I mean, I can't make schedule adjustments until after week three. Right. Uh, I will note that Cincinnati was not strong efficiency-wise on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, they were 90th. Something like that, something like 90th in my adjusted yards per play. Bring back the same quarterback in Desmond Ritter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously a good game for them to shut out Cincinnati, but I wouldn't make too much of it. It's not like they were getting, um, you know, like a team like Ohio that really had a, an efficient offense last year in right. that non-conference game. Uh, yeah, I think I think this game, if I were to bet it, I'd actually be most inclined to go over the total of 61. Um, it is a large number, but I think that Ohio State's defense probably not quite where we haven't quite seen it fully yet in the sense sure. from a negative sense. And I also right. just have some respect for Indiana as a program. Um, so I think that this game would go over. I don't have a good enough read on the, the spread here to go either way, but I'd be right. intrigued by the over. Number fires numbers also uh, behind the over on this game. And uh, I believe it was... Actually, don't have it right here. But regardless, I believe that they were on the over. So I think that I, that's where I go. Anything you feel strong enough to actually back here, Ed, uh, with a total of 61 and the spread minus 16 and a half? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to stay away from this game yeah. just because, like, I had my doubts about Ohio State. That hasn't been true yet through two games. Uh, and so let's 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 see a little bit more. Let's see Ohio State get to a little bit better competition. Expand the sample size. Make the data, you know, a little bit better. I understand that for sure. Especially in a team where you don't know what to do with them. That's probably the smart way to do it. Let's go here to Alabama right. at South Carolina. Alabama, 25 and a half point favorite. Total here is 61 and a half. And South Carolina did lose its quarterback, Jake Bentley. That was back in their season opener, I believe, in the final play of the game against UNC. So, Starting true freshman Ryan Helinski, he looked awesome last week, but slight difference, Ed, between Alabama and <laughs> Charleston Southern. I don't know if I'm being, you know, I don't want to be dismissive of Charleston Southern, but slight difference. So how do you view South Carolina in general right now through the first two games? I mean, they're, they're the tough luck team of the year. <laughs> I mean, you come into this year and you have to play the top, kind of consensus top three teams in the nation, Alabama, Clemson and and uh, Georgia yeah because you're in the SEC East and and Clemson's your rival so that that sucks to begin with so you need to get that game week one win against North Carolina right that doesn't happen and you lose your quarterback for the year and Jake Bentley was a was a quarterback that I mean he's been starting for two years and heading you know into the bowl game in the 2017 season you know the numbers were impressive like they were they were uh, an, an FBS average type team Bentley came out and had a really good game against Michigan in the bowl game. It was very efficient, hit a couple deep balls, helped South Carolina win that game. And then they were very good last year. They were 14th in my adjusted yards per play, uh, even better in passing in, in terms of the rank. And now you don't have that leader anymore. I mean, that's 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 a killer. And, yeah. you know, they're they're just not catching any breaks. Uh, you know, I still, still obviously have a good defense. Um, you know, and this is an interesting one, too, because it, it's it's hard – uh, you know, my numbers like Alabama by about 15. That's obviously made, needs a big adjustment for the quarterback position right. for South Carolina. Sure. You know, do you get to 25? Probably not. But, you know, similar to what we see with the Ohio State game, you know, these top teams get the benefit of the doubt 
Yeah. Um, and, and, and partially you can think of this in terms of turnovers. Um, you know, when you're up, when you're a big favorite in a game, you tend to be up late, late in the games. That means a worse opponent has to throw to try to catch up. That lead that can lead to turnovers. Uh, sorry, that can lead to interceptions. Right. And that's what makes the spread in these big games a little bit more. Um, it, you can't really, uh, you can't have a model that gets close games right, but gets these, uh, these large spread games right as well because of the turnovers, because right. there's not going to be a huge interception differential in a close game, but there is going to be in a large spread game, um, which is something that I'm working to quantify over the course of this season. Sure. So, so Alabama, you know, I mean, when, they're, when they're playing people that are not up to the level and South Carolina is probably not without their starting quarterback, uh, you're going to see these inflated spreads. Uh, and just because the, num- the numbers, you know, my numbers say, you know, to take the underdog doesn't necessarily mean you want to bet that. And I think that one thing that backs up your point is you look back at, we were talking about the Browns-Titans games last week, and that was in the NFL, right. but I think it's a good parallel because early in right. that game, it was a very close game the entire way. Then there's a safety. Cleveland has its left tackle ejected, and then their backup left tackle gets hurt, and things spiral. And so Baker Mayfield is trying to be aggressive to make up this yep. scoring differential, and aggressiveness right. in that situation is not a bad thing, but it does lead to picks. Exactly. And that kind of compounds things, and that's why we saw right. things get so out of hand and Tennessee win that game so handedly, and that's what you're going to see in these situations too. And I think that you look at South yep. Carolina, the question you ask is, can they keep themselves out of grotesquely negative game script long enough to avoid right. that count compounding issue? And if you think they can then you bet them plus 25 and a half. If you think that Alabama comes out and throat stomps right away, then you probably need to, you know, factor in the compounding. So it's a question of, do you think South Carolina will be relevant early in this game? If yes, take that number. Uh, And I think that that's, that's definitely a compounding factor. You know, you talk about the difficulties in projecting games with spreads this wide does that push you towards betting like first half lines? Because like I've seen, right. it seems like they've been rising in popularity. Do you have a take yeah. on that necessarily, or I mean, is it just reducing half- the sample size too much for you? No, I mean it's not necessarily sample size thing. I mean, I I I just haven't looked into first half betting much right. because I haven't looked at the data in why you know the first half lines are usually more than half yeah. of of what the game lines, are. and and I know there's a good reason for that. Um, but I just haven't looked into that. So I, I tend to not do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you like the favorite to cover, you probably more like the first half line, right? You know, especially in these, these powerhouse teams against FCS programs, uh, you can potentially like, um, just run it up in the first half, 42, nothing, then, you know, trot out whoever's available for the second half. Uh, so I think yeah, that's a very exactly. interesting game. I don't have a good enough feel to bet uh, the spread in that or the the spread in that game. I, if, again, if I had to go, I I might just go South Carolina, and but like I don't feel good enough. I'm not going to bet on a backup quarterback as a true yeah. freshman against Alabama. So personally, I'm staying away. Any definitive ones from you here, Ed? Uh, no, not really. I do want to bring up a point where you talked about like uh, you know the fact that you do need to be aggressive when you're down. Yeah. Uh, and. Baker Mayfield was a perfect example of that in the NFL week one. And Kevin Cole, uh, who's at Pro Football Focus, brought up a really good point. You know, we we laud Aaron Rodgers for for not throwing interceptions. Right. But perhaps maybe that's not the optimal strategy. You know, like when you're down late in games, you shouldn't be just trying to protect the ball. You should be taking some risks downfield. And on the flip side, that says, all right, well, I mean, you give Baker a little bit of a pass for throwing those picks. Right down late in the game i mean that's you have to be a little bit aggressive in that situation and i don't think that's something that's really appreciated in the numbers yet and and certainly not my numbers and and something i'm working towards getting a better feel for well it's not even just that um it's also that sometimes people will think that they are being risk averse and take a sack rather than trying to force a ball into coverage but like i said like a sack is pretty damaging too and aaron Rodgers' sack numbers last year were high which is interesting considering the talent they have at left tackle like they have one of the best left tackles in football and david bakhtiari he shouldn't have a high sack total so it's not just the fact that he didn't throw picks it's also the fact that he took a lot of sacks potentially in lieu of uh throwing those picks and maybe the aggressiveness should have been higher 
Like Peyton well, Manning exactly. was never a low interception dude. Like he took yeah. risks. And, and that actually brings up another point. Uh, I had Dr. Eric Eager on my podcast this week, and he's done some really interesting things to show how much of pressure rates from the defense, like the quarterback owns, right. as opposed yeah. to the offensive line. And and that's been really interesting too, because you watch the Monday night game and it looked like Deshaun Watson was almost like inviting the sack in some sense. Well, like he's been he's, the po- poster boy of that discussion. Uh, exactly. He and Russell Wilson have been the two who have been criticized the most for inviting pressure. And yeah, I mean, when you hold on to the ball, I mean, if you're just a split second late on your read or your decision, um, that can lead to problems. And, and he's done some interesting work. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it all kind of comes into, you know, a more modern understanding. And, you know, Eric's done all that work on the NFL. Uh, it's interesting to apply that to the college level. Uh, I'm thinking about Michigan in particular. Yeah. And, and Shea Patterson, you know, didn't have the best game against Army and, and oftentimes was dropped back to pass and uh, didn't get the ball out, had to pull it down and run. Well, he got the and, ball out. Just uh, it was a fumble rather than a, a pass attempt. Like, can we get... Shea Patterson, some stick them like it's a yeah, it's a real issue, I think. Yeah, and it's it's a real issue too. And and I feel like a couple years ago, I would have been like, yeah, you know, just protect the ball. You know, right. fumbles are kind of random. And but now, the more we think about it, it's like, well, the quarterback has even more control over what's going on in the football field than we initially thought. It's yeah. not just the accuracy. It's it's you know, this decision making is really affecting sack rates and everything, um, you know, related to that. Yeah. So, so it's making me look at football a little bit differently. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, that's how we, we all get smarter. And hopefully we can use that to make better bets. And I think that that can help be helpful for live betting, too. Like, if you see a game getting out of hand, but it's not a game where the team that's trailing will just roll over and die, like, if they're going to mm-hmm. keep trying to come back, it's going to lead to extra aggressiveness. And I right. think that that can be a factor when you're live betting as well. Uh, so mm-hmm. keep that in mind. Try to keep a gauge on a team's desperation factor. And if you think they're going to get aggressive and force themselves into mistakes, account for that when you're making your live bets too. Well, and and plus like, I mean, you guys do that for fantasy all the time, right? Right. When you're looking for an offense, that's going to be down late in games. Right. A lot of opportunities to throw. Well, for me, it's actually defense. Uh, So like talking about from like a fantasy perspective, I want my defense facing a lot of pass attempts because to score points in fantasy, you need sacks interceptions, force fumbles, right. and right. what is the, pa- the the play on which those are most common? It's a pass. Uh, so yep. basically you want to have the opposing team in negative game script so that they're right. throwing and that they're pulling a Jameis Winston and tossing pick sixes. Right. Uh, so exactly. That, and, you could, yeah. and you could care less if they give up a big play. It's great. In fact, that really helps you. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but I think it's important to keep that in mind for live betting, too. Uh, so that will be a factor with Alabama, South Carolina. So I think that live uh, in-game betting, definitely a fun angle to keep an eye on here. You know, check out how South, South Carolina does early on, and that's going to dictate how things go for the rest of the game. Anything else you see on the board here you want to mention uh, for week three in college football? And we're going to talk about, again, Iowa, Iowa State in covering the future. Uh, but anything else you want to tack on here before we move on to that? Um, yeah, no, not really. I mean, let's, let's move on to Iowa, Iowa State. All right, let's do it. Covering the future. All right, before we take a look at El Asico, we got to talk to you about odds fire. I was talking about some of those numbers during that last segment about how much money is on, uh, the, the total and stuff like that. And how many people are betting on Ohio state, et cetera, et cetera. That all comes from odds fire. And Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison. Our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Odds fire is a premier odds comparison service across major bookmakers in the regulated U S market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value and even examine first party fan duel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on Numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Let's dive in now to Iowa State against Iowa. I am from Minnesota originally. I have a friend, a uh, couple friends went to Iowa State. I have friends, my mom is from Iowa. So, like, I have a lot of rooted, rooted, or like, vested interest in this game, Ed. 
You yeah. want to talk about this game because your numbers see an edge within it. Uh, so talk to me about Iowa, Iowa State. Right now it's Iowa minus 2.5. Total here is 44.5. What do you see with this one? Yeah, I mean, I've been a big fan of of Iowa State this preseason. Uh, we've talked about that on the show. I see them as a dark horse contender to potentially win the Big 12. And a lot of that is they bring back Brock Purdy, the quarterback who was fantastic as a true freshman last year. They also have a pretty good defense. Uh, they had the second best defense in the Big 12 in terms of pass defense and my adjusted yards per play. And they had a lot of guys returning with experience on, on that side of the ball. But then week one happened. They played Northern Iowa at home. The game went into overtime, and they were actually down three, and they fumbled the ball right near the goal line. And obviously, if Northern Iowa recovers that, the game is over, and and then every uh, and then it's a crisis in in Ames. But Brock Purdy jumped on the the football. They took it in for a touchdown. On the next play, they ended up winning that game. Now, whenever you get a three point win over an FCS team, that's really not gonna gonna impress anyone right and and when i make adjustments to my model like iowa state's obviously getting dinged for that but they look better in the underlying statistics when you look at yards per play they had 5.4 yards per play compared to 3.6 for northern iowa i told you about this model earlier where i take yards per play and total yards in a game to project out a score um and you know by the underlying metrics iowa state would have won 31 to 11. But that's not what happened on the scoreboard, but it, it just gives you an idea for what happened in the underlying numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm also starting to look at success rate, and here uh, Iowa State also did a lot better. They had a 44% success rate compared to 33 for Northern Iowa. Uh, it was very asymmetric, and I think you you do have to be um, you do have to be concerned about Iowa State in that they only had a 34% success rate on rushing, so a lot of their success came through the air and and with Brock Purdy's arm. So they may not be able to run the ball uh, again this year, uh, an area that they struggled even with David Montgomery last year. So, you know, this preseason, I had Iowa and Iowa State basically at an identical rating, which means that with Iowa State at home, I would have made them about a three-point favorite in this game. Iowa hasn't shifted much. Um, you know, they've, they've done what they're supposed to do against Miami of Ohio and Rutgers. And, you know, Iowa State's definitely getting dinged for, for this game against Northern Iowa. But I don't think it's a five-and-a-half point shift. Um, I, I like Iowa State at home with the points plus two-and-a-half. Uh, and and I think it's going to be a close game. You know, obviously, uh, a late score can definitely affect this game. But, I mean, I think Iowa State can win outright. I don't I – don't, um, I, 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 I still think they're a good team. The money line here is plus 115 on Iowa State. And mm. I think that that's – Pretty interesting. 115? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Because uh, I, I would think it, it would be it would be higher with a spread of two and a half. Oh, well, so that might... Some, there's some big in there, for sure. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. But I think it's interesting, and hearing you talk about that, that UNI game, like, I did get to catch part of that game, and it didn't feel as close as it, it wound up being. And I think mm -hmm. that, that your numbers kind of validate that. And it's also like, yes, it is an FCS team, but Northern Iowa is consistently yep. among the best FCS teams in yep. the nation. Uh, there's that little rivalry. You and I always plays Iowa or Iowa State really well whenever they play, like every single time. Uh, you and I right. is ranked 10th in the FCS rankings right now. Like they're a good football team, even if they are an FCS team. It was week Absolutely. one for Iowa State, playing without Hakeem Butler, without David Montgomery. That's a pretty big changeover. So I and they also have a week off. Like they had a week off after right. that, so they are yeah. rested. Iowa kind of rested because they played Rutgers. Like, <laughs> did they actually play a game last week? Uh, but <laughs> I think that well, looking at Brock, yeah, allegedly, I'm not going to confirm or deny that one. Uh, but Brock Purdy in that game. Uh, 41 attempts, seven or 278 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Played pretty well. And mm -hmm. he's also, like, I would say underrated athletically. Uh, I don't know if that's, okay. like, I don't know if that's, like, being outlandish. But, like, he did run for 308 yards last year. And that is while mm -hmm. including sacks in that number. So I think that Brock Purdy is just a good quarterback who is at home right. and is getting points here. So I think yeah. that... 
I would be okay with either the spread of the money line. I'd probably just go the money line, honestly. Uh, but money line sounds pretty good. Yeah, plus one fifteen, I think, is a good number. So, are we in agreement? Uh, Iowa State money line here. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll take Iowa State plus two and a half too. I'd, I'd do both. All right, cool. Um, so we've got Iowa State, uh, either the money line or the spread, whichever you're feeling more. But I think that's a, a pretty good one. And, and broadly, I think it's important just to note the context of that game, where it was their first game without two yep. big offensive pieces, facing a good team. Now they have a bye week at home. There are a lot of things surrounding that game that are different now. So I think it'll be a fun game. It's always yeah. like it's always like kind of a slop fest. There's a reason it's called El Asico. Well, but like they're fun. They're fun football yeah. games still. Yeah, and, and this definitely makes you think about the under too. Iowa has yeah. an excellent defense. Uh definitely gonna be able to slow down Iowa State on offense. I mean, a lot of this game's gonna be on whether Purdy can make plays with his arm. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have too much faith in Nate Stanley, the Iowa quarterback. So I don't see a lot of points in this game. You know, it should be an ugly, slow game that comes down, down to the wire. I just like Ohio, uh, Iowa State's chances there. Uh, another thing I want to mention, you did mention the, the bye week, which yeah. gives Iowa State rest. It, it also kind of screws with my model because okay. it's oh, one game. It's one game is kind of being counted as two when I make yeah. these kind of season adjustments, which is not really fair to Iowa State. Right. Um, so, you know, um, so, yeah. So anyways, like it's it's probably overestimating the adjustment for Iowa State at this point. So okay. a, a lot of things point towards the Cyclones for this game. All righty. Uh, I'm sure that uh, be happy to hear that should be a fun game. College game day going to be there. So uh, I was sad that the Syracuse game went the way it did last week. Cause I live in Syracuse and I wanted to go mm-hmm. to game day. But right. You can kind of tell that was coming. Uh, like I was listening to the pregame shows and everyone was talking about college game day and being there the next week. And it's like, well, you're setting yourself up for some disappointment. And that's exactly how it happens. So uh, hopefully things are fun out there in Ames. For my cover in the future, Ed, I want to talk, I want to get your thoughts on this. Because when I first look, looking at the NFL this weekend, I love the under for the Chargers and the Lions in Detroit. And I want to get your thoughts on this because it's a it's an interesting conundrum that I have here because the Lions are going to be a super run heavy team this year. And that's why I think that in general, they're probably not going to be in a lot of high scoring games. They played a pace up game last week against Arizona. So their slow nature didn't really show up, but they threw only 47 percent of the time on first down in the first half last week, which is a very low number. They did that well, uh, but the Cardinals defense is terrible. The Chargers defense does not have Derwin James, but they're still much better. The Chargers will throw more often, but they're also missing their left tackle, which does ding their entire offense. Didn't do a ton last week against Indy, despite the fact that's kind of middling defense. And Detroit's defense is not bad either, especially they can get some pressure on the passer, which could show up those issues at left tackle. So I generally love games in domes, and I tend to think highly of them. But I think this one will go under. But the problem, this is why I want to talk to you about it, Ed, is that mm-hmm. I'm in the minority here because the total has already risen. It opened at 47. It's now 47 and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook, and it is actually higher elsewhere, which is probably why 86% of the bets and 92% of the money at FanDuel Sportsbook are on the over. That is according to Oddsfire. So it very well could rise even more during the week, especially with this number being 48 elsewhere. I would expect it to get to 48 at FanDuel Sportsbook at some, po- some point, but I personally feel very good about the under here. So I feel good about my number, but I'm in the minority here. So how do yeah. you handle those situations personally? How long are you willing to wait for that number to potentially get better before you pull the trigger and dive in? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a tough one. I mean, right now, just kind of early season, um, you know, Detroit had like the 21st, you know, a, a below average defense last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, could they bounce back? Sure, with a little bit of health and and some and good bounces their way. Um, so, you know, I mean, I definitely like your thinking about that. I I, I think I would definitely wait a little bit while longer yeah. and see you know see what happens when you know some of these limits start to go up and um, yeah, I would wait a little bit longer on that one. And I think that there's very good odds it gets to 48. So I wouldn't touch it until it gets that high because I think that the odds it gets there are quite high. But I just think this game is probably going to be a little more run heavy. And again, it kind of goes back to what we talked about before, where the holding calls in 
run heavy games are going to be more apparent. And I think we saw right. a lot of those holding calls in week one. And like, as a viewer, it was very frustrating to watch all these flags. Uh, Cleveland's had like, right. I think it was 20 penalties. Uh, like it's kind of insane. So I want to bet unders in games that include run heavy teams. I expect Detroit to be a run heavy team this year. And they were when, you know, things were in their favor in week one. So I think mm-hmm. I do like the under here, but just broadly, I, I just wanted to talk broadly about your thoughts on when you ha- like a number that you know has a possibility of getting better. So I'm, I, I agree. I think I should hold off there. Yeah. I mean, it's anyone's guess where the market's going to go, right? Right. Like no one knows in particular. And like the best example was uh, I talked to Chris Andrews, who's the director of the South Point Sportsbook before the Super Bowl last year. Yeah. And the day I talked to him, he had moved the line to, I think, New England by three. Yeah. And then he quickly moved it back to two and a half. <laughs> and, you know, he came on my podcast and was like, yeah, this number is going to three. So I was like, great. You know, this guy knows more about anything, uh, right. more than anyone about, you know, where these games go. And I liked uh, the Rams in that game. So, yeah. you know, why not wait until it gets to three? Right. Well, I never got the three. Right. So. Uh, so that's how it goes sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a market. It, it's random. We don't know what other people are thinking yet. And, and we just kind of follow and, and see what happens. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's it's very interesting, that angle of it. And we've talked with a lot of our guests about trying to get the best number. Uh, and I think that things like Odds Fire can help you get that number, just knowing where the money is at that time and saying, OK, maybe you should hold off because people are leaning this way. That is all we have for today. But once again, we're going to be back tomorrow to preview week two of the NFL season, breaking down three of the biggest games and including, again, that Dolphins-Patriots game, which should be fascinating uh, discussion. Looking forward to that. Make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the uh, Google Play Store, TuneIn, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find Covering the Spread. Ed, you mentioned a new podcast up at the Football Analytics Show. Anything else yep. going on? Uh, and where can they find that podcast? Yeah, the co- podcast is the Football Analytics Show. Uh, usually have a guest on uh, every week. Uh, in a couple weeks, I'll start doing some solo shows just because I like to get some of the good insights from my numbers as they start coming in and I can make schedule adjustments also, uh, my email newsletter goes out uh, every Thursday at noon. Uh, this is where I give you a sample of predictions that I talked about on the show, and and but are usually safe for paying members of the site. Um, and I and I write up some analysis in there too. So if you like what I'm saying on the show, uh, definitely check out the newsletter uh, because that's where you can get more of it. And that's at thepowerrank.com, and the podcast right. is a football analytics show. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. Uh, you can fo- follow me there and the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for working the video side of things today. Cal, thank you for keeping us on the air as always. And a thank you to those of you for tuning in for today. Back tomorrow to talk some NFL. We'll get you then, and good luck with college football in week number three. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.